Lord. Why the he got Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a review, a classic review, in fact, of the 1971 album from Canadian-American singer, songwriter, poet, and painter, Joni Mitchell Blue. Joni freaking Mitchell, an artist who cut her teeth in the commotion of the contemporary folk and singer-songwriter wave of the 60s and 70s. But you could argue that by the time Joni came out with her debut album, a lot of the major players in this genre of music had already been established. Joan Baez and Dave Van Ronk were key figures that uh, built names for themselves in the New York scene, uh, kind of bringing back generations old folk tunes. Meanwhile, Guthrieite Bob Dylan uh, had already been labeled uh, the voice of a generation and had pissed off leagues of folksters by going electric and embracing more rock aesthetics on later records. Simon and Garfunkel and Judy Collins began to represent more pop-centric trends in the folk scene as they progressed deeper into their careers, respectively. It's important to bring all of this up to understand why Joni Mitchell arrives at the time she does, and most importantly, uh, why does Blue hit commercially at the time, too? as it was a top 10 record in the UK, in Canada, a uh, top 20 in the US, and its legacy has landed it on more greatest albums of all time lists uh, than anyone can count. Because to be clear, we're not talking about an artist here who played Woodstock. No, as one of the most key moments as her career was beginning to gain momentum uh, was writing a song about Woodstock uh, retrospectively as a collective experience. Joni was active though, creating and performing for many of the same years as a lot of the American folk giants that she's often lumped in with, it just took her a bit longer to break through because uh, we are talking about somebody who, at a very early age, contracted polio, abandoned many formal educational pursuits in her 20s, busked to make ends meet, uh, had a child out of wedlock that she had to ultimately give up for adoption because she couldn't uh, support her at the time, also married and divorced fellow folk singer Chuck Mitchell. So you could say Joni had a lifetime of experiences to pull from, before she even put out her first record. And so the question is, how does she eventually get the reception that she does? Because after almost 10 years of American folk renaissance across the 60s, why does another artist inhabiting this lane manage to gain so much long-term attention? I would like to think it's because she was offering something uh, different than her predecessors at the time, and that her incomparable talent wasn't dependent on anyone's sound or trend or wave. Because when Joni did eventually break onto the scene, there was something truly complex, refresh, and kind of progressive about her approach to guitar, to songwriting, that really went against the rudimentary grain of most folk revivalist albums. Which is funny because in Joni's pursuit for more original sounds and songs, she penned at least a few tracks that have been covered and reworked so many times over uh, that culturally I think we kind of forget their origins lie with Joni sometimes, be that uh, songs like Circle Game or Big Yellow Taxi. Her approach to melody and song structure sometimes uh, defied a lot of pop and folk conventions too, especially given how dynamic and expansive a lot of her melodies were. So it's not surprising at all to find out that she would spend uh, the latter part of this decade working with jazz greats such as Charles Mingus, as well as embracing the aesthetics of jazz fusion on many an album, bringing on electric bass giant Jaco Pistorius as well as numerous members of, of Weather Report uh, onto her recordings. But Joni's connections to jazz and soul music have proven to be a, kind of a difficult topic in her career and defining her place in mainstream music history because simply categorizing her as a product of the uh, 60s folk and hippie movement is not just a historical, it's also effectively a whitening of her influences and style, something she herself had feelings on at the time, especially as she began to embrace uh, more jazz influences on her albums, and her way of counteracting this narrative wasn't, uh, at the time, the best, as in part it served as inspiration for her to, um, uh, dress in this uh, character that involved her doing blackface, and she did this for years. According to this Telegraph article here, uh, this character that she uh, would, again, uh, become sometimes was named Art Nouveau. And yeah, Joni appeared in public as this character performed. Uh, here she is on the front cover of her 1977 album, Don Juan's Reckless Daughter, 
where yeah, th this character at the forefront of the cover, that's that is her. That that is her as this character. Now, I guess keep in mind this wasn't necessarily done to spite black musicians, and this same article alleges that Joni, uh, the audacity of her embodying this character is part of what inspired Charles Mingus originally to uh, reach out and eventually collaborate with her. But still, it is a very, very weird uh, thing <laughs> to, to discover and also kind of like contend with as I was doing research for this review. Again, it also ties into the fact uh, that Joni, uh, more than I think any other folk artist of her generation, uh, was just hugely, massively inspired uh, by black musical art forms, especially jazz. And that often goes overlooked, uh, erased, and the eras of her career where she's kind of, you know, embracing jazz the most, uh, those are among some of the least commercially viable albums she's ever released. This kind of dead zone in Joni's catalog, she wouldn't really bounce back from it until uh, she could later be framed as more of a legacy artist in the 90s and 2000s, which of course at that point, uh, labels are only happy to uh, market you for nostalgia purposes and have you do an album where you're, you know, you're, do you're doing stuff standards with lots of strings and very lush production. So I bring this all up to say that Joni is much, 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 much more, uh, for better or for worse, than just some guitar strumming beatnik uh, from the, you know, flower child era. And that is clear if you actually dig into the many musical complexities and nuances of Blue. A record where she clearly didn't want to repeat the uh, streamlined compositions and proverbial messaging that she engaged in on her last full-length LP where she had a couple of unforeseen hits. And that kind of sudden success, of course, will bring you an audience that will be waiting with bated breath to hear what you're about to do next. And Joni's answer to that call was to bring uh, more intricacy to her tracks. These guitar, piano, and Appalachian dulcimer ballads uh, that frankly had grooves and chord progressions uh, that were very idiosyncratic, that were restless, that were tense, that were as complicated complicated as the stories that fueled them. Like the opening track, All I Want, which is uh, a little deceptively titled. Kind of seems like uh, it would be a little simple on the surface, but what does Joni want on this track? She kind of wants everything. It's about an endless string of never-ending wants, really being tossed into this whirlwind of desire, in which Joni manages to showcase uh, whimsy and grace with some stellar winding vocal melodies throughout the entire track, and some incredible chord phrasing, too. So, yeah, a killer start to the record. Uh, from here we go to My Old Man, which is a grand poetic display of adoration, one of her best love songs ever in my view, because on this track you'll find some of the sweetest and most endearing descriptions uh, that any person has ever written to another in song, along with, of course, other tracks on this record too, such as uh, A Case of You. But yeah, not only do I love uh, just the intense feelings of infatuation on this track, but uh, also the way the piano and chords uh, sound like they're in complete disarray as Joni begins to describe how she feels, how life feels when this person is gone. It's one of many uh, genius strokes of not just lyrical storytelling, but musical storytelling across the record. The following Little Green is a tender acoustic ballad, a heart-wrenching moment that now in retrospect uh, we understand to be, at least in part, uh, a tribute to the daughter Joni had to give up for adoption, which was not known at the time that the record was released. This is information uh, that would become more widely known decades later. But understanding that now, uh, the content of this track is uh, devastating, but also uh, really beautiful and encouraging. The gentle finger-picked arpeggios across the track, too, are wonderful. Meanwhile, Carrie is another character portrait of sorts of this man that Joni seems to be taken with, but eventually has to leave as she's kind of leading this nomadic life where she's traveling from place to place to place. And she's also kind of going over these fun, chaotic experiences that she's having with furiously strummed guitar, some hand drums, and some uh, kind of warm, slightly fuzzy electric bass too. Also, Joni's vocal performance on this track, and many other moments on this record, is amazing. Her vibrato, 
her volume and breath control, the fact that she's able to uh, so precisely uh, jump from note to note to note in a way that frankly is pretty unconventional but simultaneously uh, comes across as just very accessible. This is also one of many tracks on the record that feels uh, specifically tied to a place or a location or movement, which you could also say is the case for California, where Joni describes uh, many beautiful and wonderful things about that place that kind of uh, draws her to it, as well as this flight tonight, which is a kind of an intense tale of a plane trip with these big, widely panned rock and acoustic guitars. A little sound play at one point, too, making it sound like, uh, you know, multiple vocals from her coming out over an intercom. And again, I'm loving uh, the contrast between uh, the big fat, heavy guitars, the chords, which are very straightforward, but then also on top of that, Joni's uh, super precise bird-like vocal melodies. But this and tracks like it only represent one side of the record. Uh, on many other cuts, you have these very pensive, very mournful piano ballads, like the title track, which is another uh, love or tribute type song of sorts, in reference to a sailor and his tattoos, and kind of uh, using metaphor to talk about uh, the many horrible or dark waves that one person might need to go through and overcome in life. The song River is another great piano ballad and has a super strong sense of uh, not just place but time as its story ties in with a lot of holiday themes and Joni uh, effectively echoes that on the piano with these uh, very slight interpolations of Christmas tunes at a few different points. And I just love, uh, again, the restlessness and the sense of escapism in the writing on this track too as she describes uh, this kind of, you know, snowless, music scene that she has currently ingrained herself in and just wanting to leave, wanting to get out of there. It's, uh, I don't know, maybe an example of some Canadian longing going on. Then there's the closer, The Last Time I Saw Richard, which, in my opinion, uh, really encapsulates what makes Joni's music so special, as she has this capacity to write great songs that uh, simultaneously feel very samey but also ever-evolving, because this track feels very much like a motif, like a story song that is hanging in a very specific and singular place, but I'm hanging on the edge of my seat, uh, really eating up every word, every description she's delivering, every melodic embellishment, every little extra piano uh, alteration or variation. And like any motif type moment, it doesn't have the most well-defined structure or resolution, uh, not even a big chorus or hooky little nugget for you to be waiting for at the very end. No, I mean, the whole thing really kind of finishes on an un defined cliffhanger because uh, in many ways not not everything resolves or completes in a tight and defined way. But even without finishing things off in that sense as most songwriters uh, do and feel almost the pressure to, uh, in those moments where Joni can kind of just like create a vibe on a song, it still feels so great and so immersive and so nourishing, especially as she gives these vocal performances that feel more dictated by what she's saying as opposed to uh, the melody she's singing, but uh, melody still doesn't really get sacrificed at the hand of that, and musically, uh, what she's doing is just still so engaging and so wonderful. But uh, look, even that is just one of many things that Joni had a, a serious talent for, especially in this phase of her career, which in her overall catalog is just like a, a great, prime sort of spot in terms of like, you know, it's it's super accessibly direct from a songwriting standpoint. It's very folky, it's very acoustic, it's very organic, it's very intimate. It's not quite going into that super jazzy direction or sophisti pop direction uh, that she would be embracing later in the 70s, but simultaneously, it's not as simple as the release she was dropping before this record too. It's uh, complex, both emotionally and musically. That, among many other things, is what makes it such a special release uh, for singer-songwriter music, for Joni Mitchell's catalog, and just in the greater popular music canon generally. Those are my thoughts on this album. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think about it. Transition, have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? You're the best, you're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like. Please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head is another video you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Joni Mitchell, uh, forever.